We are going to start by jumping right into the scriptures, so you want to have your Bibles open. Uh, if you happen to be visiting, we are in a long study in the Gospel of John, and we've been working our way through the last few hours of Jesus' life. And so I want to pick up, uh, we'll just read right off the top the text, and then we'll jump into unpacking it, and what does it mean to us, and how do we apply it to our lives. So we're in John chapter 19, and picking up from where we left off last weekend, verse 31, since it was the day of preparation... And so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw this is born witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So that's the reading of God's word. So I don't know uh, how often in your life you have thought about little coincidences, so-called coincidences. I think the the simple ones and the uh, like kind of inconsequential ones, last summer we happened to be walking along the uh, the Vedder River out in Chilliwack and this couple walking toward us that I somehow am trying to piece together a familiar face and then you realize it's friends of ours from Saskatchewan, but what are they doing on the Vedder River in Chilliwack? Uh, and they happen to be visiting, or laying on the beach in Oregon and hearing a voice behind you saying, Pastor Mark, which is not what you want to hear when you're on vacation in Oregon with your family. And those kind of kawinky dinkies, if you will, those coincidences that just happen along our life. Uh, So Abraham Kuyper uh, was a pastor who turned politician. He ultimately became the prime minister of the Netherlands. Is famous for this, uh, for many things, but this one particular statement he is very famous for, that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Now, it was funny in the first hour, there was a little kid sitting here who uh, echoed that back, and I think it was, you know, off the Disney movie. Mine, mine, mine. But anyway, Christ, who is sovereign over all, over every issue and domain of the universe, cries out mine. And as we've been working through these last few hours of Jesus' life, the Last Supper, the betrayal, the six trials, his being beaten and mocked and ultimately nailed to a Roman cross, several times we have seen this phrase, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. That the scriptures might be fulfilled. So in John 13 and John 17, he points out the one who was going to betray him and then adds the comments that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Last week, there were two more. They were gambling for his clothing and they gave him sour wine to drink that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And in today's text, we saw two more. As the scripture says, not a bone will be broken and that he would be pierced. The divine coincidences, the just so happens that were fulfilled in Jesus' life. So maybe you know this, but there were over 300 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Over 300. Amazing. And back in the 1950s, a guy named uh, Dr. Peter Stoner wrote a book called Science Speaks. Now, he was a professor of science, mathematics, and astronomy, and he was also a Christian. And he began to ask the question, could we use mathematics? Could we use the the studies of probabilities and statistics to prove the truth of Scripture? And knowing that there were over 300 prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus lived, could we look at them and see what what was the statistical probabilities that they could be fulfilled in just one individual in human history? And so he took just eight of the best-known prophecies. The prophecy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, that a messenger would prepare the way for that Messiah, that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, that he would be betrayed by a friend, that that friend would use those 30 pieces, of, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and that that betrayal price would purchase the potter's field, that the Messiah would remain silent while he was afflicted, and that he would die by having his hands and feet pierced. Just those eight out of 300. 
and then ran the odds, ran the probabilities, spread out over those centuries, spread out over the millions of people who would have lived in between and back and forth. And he made this comment that it produces a probability that all eight prophecies being fulfilled accidentally in the life of one person, that probability is one to 10 times the 17th power or one with 17 zeros behind it. That is one in 100 quadrillion. You're like, what the heck is a quadrillion? There's no way for us to imagine that number, the size of that number. And so he did some work on that. And he said here to illustrate it would be like this. If it were possible to cover the entire state of Texas, 270,000 square miles, knee deep in silver dollars, and then put a black X on the back of one silver dollar, throw it into the middle of the pile, blindfold an individual, put them into Texas, and that they would pick up that one silver dollar with a black X. That's one to 100 quadrillion odds. No divine accidents. No divine coincidences. The Lord is sovereign over every detail. And so what happened on the eve of Passover nearly 2,000 years ago was no accident. Every detail was planned by the sovereign hand of God. And our text is difficult to read. As you read through the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, it is not easy reading. It is, it is painful reading, and yet it is also simple to understand that Jesus Christ died via a Roman crucifixion. And this story is loaded with theological significance. It is the high point of the Christian story. And if we were to summarize it down to one sentence, to one big idea, to summarize all of the Gospels into one statement, we could do no better than grabbing Paul's summary in 1 Corinthians 15 when he said, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then this one-liner, this end to it, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. All of those Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Christ, according to the scriptures, he died for our sins. And so we're going to run through our text. We already read it. We're going to look at three things. We're going to just simply quickly look at what happened. We're going to talk about what was accomplished, the theological underpinnings behind it, and then finally, why it matters. So first, what happened? Just four things that I want to point out or take note of. The first is this, that the Jewish leaders wanted these men taken down. They are like, get them down, get them off the cross. And there are a couple reasons that they wanted to get them down. It was the preparation day, the day before the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, they could do no work. And so they, they couldn't bury, they couldn't dig a grave, and they wouldn't want to do that on the Sabbath. So get them down before the Sabbath. But more importantly was this teaching from Deuteronomy 21. The law would say, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on that tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God and you shall not defile your land. There was something, we're not told why, there was something significant about a person nailed to, hanged to a tree that brought a curse. And so God would say, bury that person before the day, before the sun goes down so that you don't defile the land in which you live. Now, what is ironic in this text is that these spiritual leaders were so concerned for following this particular aspect of the law. Meanwhile, they're violating so many other parts of the law. But that was the first point. Get them down before sundown. Secondly, the broken bones, verse 32 and verse 33. Now, what we know of crucifixion, and if you have studied it a bit, you will know that it is perhaps the cruelest form of capital punishment ever invented. The Persians actually invented it, and the Romans perfected it. It was meant to extract the greatest amount of suffering possible. To bring a person literally to the brink of death but not actually kill them so that they would linger in their agony and in their pain. And the torture itself often did not actually kill them. That stapling a person to a cross in and of itself was not lethal. It was the exposure to the elements, the dehydration, heart failure, and blood loss, and most common, suffocation is how the people on the cross would die. And you can imagine, hung there, stretched out with your arms as far as they would go and, and nailed through the wrists and the feet stretched down and the, the, the torso stretched and the lungs flattened. And the only way that you can get air into those lungs is if you push yourself up to breathe in a shallow breath and the, the pain on your wrists, the pain on your feet, pushing on those places where you have been pierced. And so four soldiers would stand by waiting for them to die. 
And they could not leave until they had died. And so sometimes to hurry up this process, if they were tired of waiting, they would take an iron mallet and they would come and they would smash the legs of those who were on the cross. And you say, why? Well, of course, so that they could no longer push themselves up. All they had left was the strength of their arms, and very quickly they could no longer pull themselves up to get that air, and most would suffocate within just a few minutes of having their legs broken. Verse 36 says they come to Jesus, and he's already dead to fulfill the prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. At Psalm 34, verse 20, he keeps all of his bones. The Lord looks after his righteous one. Not one of them is broken. It's also an echo back to Exodus 12, the the Passover lamb, that little spotless lamb that was taken for the Passover meal. One of the stipulations was that none of its bones could have been broken. It had to be perfect, a spotless lamb. So number three, the pierced side, the blood in the water. Now the blood we understand clearly, but you're like, well, what's the water thing about? Like how does water come out of a person hanging on a cross? Now I'm not a medical doctor, just, just to tell you that in case you thought I was. Uh, uh, medical explanations, though, they tell us that there are two possibilities. If you talk to medical experts, that there are two terms, pericardial effusion and hemoperitoneum. Like, that took me all week practicing that, hemoperitoneum. So put that one into a conversation this week. So pericardial effusion is the sac around the heart that can fill with a, an injury will fill with a clear fluid. And so perhaps that sword per- pierces the heart and that fluid Uh, It leaks out, but probably more likely it's the hemoperitoneum. It's when the internal organs are damaged because of a great fall or a beating or an injury and you have internal bleeding and the internal cavity, the chest cavity, the abdominal cavity fills with blood that can press on the lungs and cause suffocation. But all that blood that is captured there after death begins to separate. And what looks like water and blood, and it it tells us that the death had already occurred because the blood was separating into the heavier red cells that would drop to the bottom and the lighter serum that would be at the top. And when they're pierced, the blood comes out and then the water that follows. Verse 37 says, this is what the scripture said would happen, that he would be pierced. Three texts, Psalm 22, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. With his wounds were healed. Zechariah says, uh, when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. They're going to look on the one they've pierced and they will see this fountain for cleansing. Many of you have sung these words, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain. A fountain will be opened on that day. They will look on the one they pierced. Free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. They looked on the one that they have pierced. And then fourth, John adds this comment. There were eyewitnesses. Verse 35. The one who saw it knows that his testimony is true and his testimony is true so that you might believe. It sounds like John's thesis statement for the book. These things I've written so that you might believe. More than likely, this is John giving testimony that it is me, I am the eyewitness. But commentators also make the the comment that it could also refer to the soldier. Uh, Verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And then verse 35, and he who saw it has borne witness. That very soldier, of course, was there to bear witness. And possibly, as John is writing this book, those soldiers were still alive. And certainly the women standing at Jesus' cross. And so John could say, if you don't believe me, uh, search out some of those soldiers. Search out the women who were standing there. They were eyewitnesses to this. Our eyes have seen that he truly died. Now, we're going to move on to what he accomplished, but I want to just point out three divine coincidences, quote unquote. Uh, If you like Bible trivia, you will love this stuff because we're told it is the day of preparation. It's the day before the Passover. It's also just so happens to be the day before the Sabbath. Why do I say that? Because the Passover didn't always fall on the Sabbath. The Passover was the 15th day of the month. And whatever day, the 15th day, that's when you celebrate Passover. Just like we celebrate Christmas on December 25th, no matter what day of the week December 25th happens to be, Christmas can be on any day of the week. It's the date that is important. So on the 15th, about 11 or 12 times in a century, In a 100 years, the Passover will happen to fall on the Sabbath. You're like, why is that important? 
because it helps us date the crucifixion of Jesus. Because there were only two times near that end of Jesus' life when the Sabbath and the Passover corresponded, AD 30 or in AD 33. So we know that Jesus was crucified in one of those others, either the earlier date, AD 30, or more than likely, AD 33, because the Passover happened, just so happened, divine coincidence, to fall on the Sabbath. The other divine coincidence in this is this. That Jesus, because he was crucified on the eve of the Passover, the day of preparation, it was in that afternoon that literally tens of thousands of lambs all across the country were being slaughtered and their blood was being shed. Josephus, the Roman historian, told us that the average little lamb would feed about 10 people. And there were something like two million people that would descend upon Jerusalem. So you can imagine how many thousands and thousands of little lambs had to be slaughtered to feed all those people, one lamb per 10 person. And while that blood was being shed between three and five in the afternoon was the very same time that Jesus is hanging on the cross and the lamb of God is shedding his blood for the sins of the world. Is that not a divine coincidence? And then number three, and this one isn't in the text, but it is there in the history that the day after the Passover Sabbath was the Feast of First Fruits. And you're like, well, what's that about? Well, it's the beginning of the harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest to be particular. And so the Old Testament had this principle. It is still true for us today that we should bring our first and our best to the Lord. So they were an agricultural culture. So the very first of the harvest, the very first sheaf of wheat was not theirs to keep. It belonged to the Lord. And they brought it to the Lord to wave before him in a trust that the, the rest of the harvest would come in and that God would provide for them. And so they brought back to God their first and their best, the, fe- the, the feast of the first fruits that just so happened to fall on the day after the Passover, which just so happened this year to be Sunday morning, which just so happened to be the day that Jesus walked out of the tomb alive. Amen? Now, if you're tracking with me, you will know that Paul refers to this. When we get over to 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen to sleep, that Jesus became the first fruits on the feast of the first fruits. Amazing. Divine coincidence. I know. Okay, whatever. It's the Bible trivia. I love it. You love it too, because I told you, you love it. That's our text. That's what happened. But what did he accomplish? And there are so many images to describe what God was up to, all of them centering around this concept of substitution, that God would allow one to take the place of another. In fact, there's over a dozen of these particular images, and and we're going to look at just four of them for sake of time tonight. And so we want to look at this, a, a picture from the temple and a picture from the law court and a picture from the marketplace and a picture from the family. And the first one is this, a picture from the temple or of the shrine or of the place of worship. And we would talk about the penalty that is being paid and we would use this giant theological word, the word propitiation, which is not a word that we typically use in our modern English language. And yet it is an incredibly important word for us to understand because that word propitiation means that he stepped in in our place to absorb the wrath of God in our place. Every religion will ask the question, how does one get themselves right with their God? And every religion will say, you must make some sort of penance, some sort of suffering, some sort of sacrifice to pay the penalty. And Christianity says there is a high price to pay for our treason, for our rebellion against God, that there is only one way to atone for sin, that blood must be shed. And in the Christian scriptures... Our God takes that on himself. Jesus sets his face like a flint for Jerusalem. He says to his disciples, I am going there to die. In the garden, when he prays to the Father, he says, I wish this cup could pass from me. What cup? The cup of God's wrath that he would drink down in the next few hours. I would put it aside, but thy will be done. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that it was not Annas, it was not Caiaphas, it was not Judas, it was not the Jewish leaders that delivered Jesus over, although they did. It was Jesus himself who delivered himself over. He willingly laid his life down. 1 John 4 puts it this way, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. It's a picture from the temple. He is our propitiation. He pays the penalty. Secondly, a picture from the law courts. 
You go to a court of law and you are declared guilty. He pardons the guilty one. The big theological word here is the word justification. That in the court of law, a guilty verdict has been declared over every single one of our lives. Romans 3 says all have sinned. And Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. That's the guilty verdict and that is the sentence. And it points to the common denominator in all of our lives. Every person in this room, every person listening to this message, there's a common denominator in the human race. We share something in common, and it is this. It's our disease. It's our problem. It's a sinful, fallen nature that has been passed down to us from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. And if your parents in the room, you will know that this is absolutely true. Parents, you know this is true, right? We do not have to teach our children how to do wrong. We have to teach our children how to do right. Right? Those little kids, they somehow know how to do wrong, and it is our job to train them how to do right. So one of my favorite quotes of Chuck Colson's, it's in a chapter called The Barbarians in the Parlor. Love it. He says this, The little human animal will not at first have the right responses. Ordained by God as a basic unit of human organization, the family is not only necessary for propagating the race, but is the first school of human instruction. Now, here's where it gets really good. Parents take small, self-centered monsters who spend much of their time screaming defiantly and hurling peas on the carpet and teach them to share to wait their turn, to respect others' property. These lessons translate into respect for others, self-restraint, obedience to law, in short, into the virtues of individual character that are vital to a society's survival. Don't you just resonate with that? Can you not remember those little monsters in the high chair screaming at you? Come on, you're with me, you're like, right? Is it only our children? Oh, my goodness. And so if it is true that we are all sinners, then how can a just God declare us righteous? So Romans 3 tells us we've all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. And we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus. Now look at this key sentence right here. So that he might be just and the justifier. He might be just, as a just judge has to be, but he is also our justifier. In other words, miraculously, the judge steps down from the bench to take the place of the guilty one, that God makes him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. In other words, I will issue a pardon over your guilty life. And so you ask the question, how do I get in on a deal like that? How do I get pardoned for my sin? I'm glad you ask. You simply place your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus. That's all you must do. The third picture is a picture from the marketplace. So we looked at propitiation. We looked at justification. The third one is this. He releases our debts. And the picture here, the big theological word is redemption. And it is a beautiful, beautiful word. He pays our debts. Isn't that a beautiful word? Redeems us. We've gotten ourselves in over our heads. We're bankrupt. It's a picture that's used over and over and over in the Old Testament. That when one of your brothers grows poor, their crops fail or... He simply doesn't manage his money well. Or some catastrophe comes on his home and he is forced to sell his house. He's forced to sell his land. Maybe in the worst case scenario, he is forced to sell himself or his children into servitude to pay down his debts. His closest male relative is commended to redeem his brother back to pay off his debts and to buy him back, to set him free. And it's the concept the Old Testament calls kinsman redeemer, kinsman redeemer. In other words, my closest kin, my closest family member comes alongside to buy back. And so one of the most beautiful stories of the kinsman redeemer, there's an entire book in the Old Testament dedicated to this story. It is the book of Ruth. Ruth, the story of these two widows The husbands have died. They're in a foreign land, and these two widows are left destitute. The men had a tragic death and leaving them all alone. And and Naomi is the mother's name, and she's like, don't even call me Naomi anymore. Just call me Mara, because I'm bitter, and Mara means bitter, and I'm a bitter woman, but I'm going home. And you're like, why would she go home? Home to Bethlehem, because there is a hope. There's a hope that when she gets to Bethlehem, one of their near relatives, 
A kinsman redeemer might take pity on them and buy them out of their debts. And her daughter-in-law, Ruth, says, I'm going with you, mom. And it just so happens that a guy named Boaz comes along and he's willing to take up the debts of that family, the kinsman redeemer. See, the Bible uses a bunch of metaphors that refer to this same concept, captivity, slavery, exile, debt, transgression, all of those are used for the same concept. And so redemption becomes synonymous with forgiveness and freedom. The captive, the slave gets set free. The exile gets to come home. The debt gets paid down in full. The sinner is forgiven. And this is where we go, woo! Yes, that's where I say that. No one else does. Jesus redeemed us at a high price. First Peter says this, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Now look, not with perishable things such as silver and gold. It wasn't just as easy as write a big check, pay the money down. It wasn't silver and gold. It wasn't cash. He paid with precious blood, the precious blood of Christ that like a lamb without blemish or spot. And then the fourth picture is a picture from the family, a picture from home. He welcomes the prodigal. And it's the big word, the big theological word is reconciliation. And one of the most beautiful stories, some of you are already running ahead of me, the story of the prodigal son. The son who rebels against his dad and he's like, just give me my inheritance now. Take the money out of the farm. Do a second mortgage so I get my inheritance. I can't wait for you to die. And the text tells us that literally this kid goes to the city and it tells us in all honesty, he spent all of that money on alcohol and prostitutes. He lived the wild life until the money was gone. And when the money ran out, he finds himself working where no Jewish kid would ever want to work on a hog farm. And he is mucking out the manure out of the barns. And he begins to wonder in his heart of hearts, would my dad take me back? Because I know the slaves, the servants on my father's farm live much better than I'm living right now. I don't even need to be his boy again if I can just be a a servant in my dad's barns. And so he travels home, and you know the story, Luke 15, that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him, and the, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So Rembrandt paints it there. And you got to just sit and stare at the image of that father welcoming his boy and the brother standing in the background and just pondering what was going on in that story as that boy is like, would my dad, after everything that I've done to my family, all the shame that I brought across my family, would my dad take me back and that father who runs and greets his boy? What's being accomplished on that cross of Jesus? These four pictures. That he is our propitiation, he is our pardon, he is our redemption, and he is our reconciliation. And you're like, well, why does it matter? Well, it matters in big ways. It matters because the message of the cross is the high point of the Christian calendar. Every week of the year, we talk about Jesus' salvation, but at this time of the season in particular, as we head towards Easter and praying that God would awaken people to what he has done for us in this this massive gift that we celebrate, the cross and the resurrection. And you will well know this, that Christmas and Easter are still the highest attended weekends all across Canada. There literally will be tens of thousands of people show up on Christmas and on Easter that do not darken the door of the church any other time of the year, but they continue to come at Christmas and at Easter. And you ask the question, why? And at Christmas, it is much of a celebration, the birth of an infant, the coming of salvation. And we talk about peace and hope and joy and love and all those beautiful, unto you is born a child. The Passion Week, however, is different. Good Friday in particular is different as it is a sober reminder of the price that Jesus paid. Good Friday has sometimes been called Black Friday because it literally is the darkest day in human history. And and as you think and pray into Easter, would you be praying? I have been praying in, in this particular way. Would you join me? Good Friday, I think, is a great opportunity to invite back friends and family who have drifted away from the church. 
who have a Christian memory, who have some, some childhood experiences, but have, for whatever reason, drifted away, they know this story and they need to be reminded of the price that Jesus paid for them. It matters because this story goes to the heart of the gospel. It matters because our right relationship hangs in the balance. It matters because our daily joy, our daily joy hangs in the balance, friends. Uh, 1 John 3, listen to how this same author puts it later. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. Look at that word. He has lavished his love on us that we should be called children of God. And the only possible way to respond, if you truly understand the gospel, if you truly understand your sinfulness, the holiness of God, and what Jesus has done for us, the only response can be worship and surrender to that God and a joyful response of, oh God, I can't believe you love me this much. So John Stott in his book, The Cross, says this, we cannot, with a true understanding of the cross, stand with cool detachment. Because like it or not, we're involved. Our sins put him there. So far from offering us flattery, the cross undermines our self-righteousness. We can stand before it only with a bowed head and a broken spirit, and there we remain until the Lord Jesus speaks to our hearts his word of pardon and acceptance. And we, gripped by his love and full of thanksgiving, go out into the world to live our lives in his service. You see, it does not matter how long you have been a follower of Jesus. This is still good news. It is good news that we need every morning as we wake up, as we crawl out of bed, as our feet hit the floor, that we are reminded that God loved me this much to send Jesus to do for myself what I cannot do for myself, and that Christians who rightly understand this gospel should be the most joyful people on the planet. Amen? Amen. We should. God's perfect plan coming together in Jesus' life and death that there were no accidents, there were no coincidences. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Jesus set his face like a flint. He was willing to drink the cup of wrath. He gave himself for us. He laid his life down, the innocent one for the guilty. And so it's just amazing that we're coming to the communion table on a weekend like this. Because as we come to this table, there are always two equal but opposite emotions that should be in our heart. The first is this, that he did this because of me. The sober reminder, the sorrowful reminder that it was my sin, it was your sin that took him there. He did this because of us. Jesus didn't go to the cross for his own sin. He went there because of us. But secondly, and the flip side of that coin is he did this for us. And the celebration, oh my goodness, who would love like this? But God demonstrates his love while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Who would love us like that? And so as we close, I've got to ask the question that we ask so often around this place. Have you stepped into the gift of salvation freely offered to you in Jesus Christ? Have you come to the end of yourself, the end of your rebellion, the end of your mess? Have you come to believe that Jesus is the Savior you need? And if you have not done that, I beg with you, be reconciled to God. If he is calling you, respond to him by saying yes. And you go, how would I be made right with God? Simply by saying yes. Yes, Lord, I believe what your word says about me is true. I believe what your word says about Jesus is true. I know the mess I am, and I know that I can't fix it, and so I receive your gift of righteousness. Or as Paul would conclude, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Let's pray together. Also, Lord Jesus, what just a simple meat and potatoes type text. As we reflect on the condition of humanity and we look around the world and whether it is at the macro level of all the military and political mess that we see on the nightly news or down to the micro level of what's happening in the individual heart and in our homes and in our families and in our friendships and relationships, Lord, we see brokenness everywhere we look. 
And we know that ultimately when we drill down deep into that and say what was the cause, that that cause was our rebellion against our creator. That we've walked away from you. We've intentionally shook our fist and said, I'll do it on my own. And oh God, who will rescue us? Who will save us? Who would step in to do for something for us that we could not do for ourselves? And then we hear this message of Jesus' great love. That he took on human flesh to walk among us and to live a sinless life and to willingly walk the road to Calvary and to lay that life down, to deliver himself over, to pay the penalty that should have been ours. God, our response has to be, take my life and let it be dedicated, Lord, to thee. We love you, Lord. We ask that these things would embed in our hearts for your glory and our great joy. In Jesus' name, amen.